Welcome to the Side Hustle Lounge. If you're looking for flexible ways to earn income, grow your mindset, and live the lifestyle you've always dreamed of, you're in the right place. So lower the lights, grab your favorite beverage, and join your host, founder of NotaryCoach.com and Amazon best-selling author of Sign and Thrive, How to Make Six Figures as a Mobile Notary and Loan Signing Agent, Bill Soroka. Cheers and welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's been an amazing run. Almost one year we've been running the Side Hustle Lounge podcast. Thank you for all of your support. Uh, I think uh, we've had 55 episodes released over the last uh, nearly a year. I guess it's been about 11 months right now. For right now, I'm taking a brief hiatus from releasing new episodes. Instead, the amazing production team here uh, at Side Hustle Lounge and uh, the Get Known podcast has put together a compilation of some of the best of eight different episodes that you can listen to this week. And then we'll be back in April with more new episodes of the Side Hustle Lounge. Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. The voice that we have in our head, that that's the most important voice. We hear it the most throughout our life and it does. It molds our feelings, then it molds our behavior. And so I think it's critical. And my inner critic can be a real bitch sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it just tears me apart at times. So I, I love that you've focused on that. And Brene Brown, she is, I just feel like we're besties after I've read her book yeah, and she really did. Yeah. She got me through some of those heartache moments mm-hmm. through Daring Greatly. Um, I love that. Now, for the, how do people know, because your book is called Rock Bottom is where bad bitches are built. So how do you know if you're at rock bottom? Excellent question. And I think that that is, it's different for all of us. And you may hit rock bottom several different times, you know, it's before you've actually, and and I don't know what the actual rock bottom is for anyone. Um, I thought I had reached it when going through all the different things in the book. And then since then something, something else has happened. And it's like, well, you know, I, I wrote about this and I said that this is probably not going to be the last rock bottom. And here we are. And um, so it's, it's just, I think for me, rock bottom is, getting to a place in your life where you feel like your resources or your coping skills are pretty much tapped out and you feel almost desperate, you know, like I, I don't know where to go from here. Um, and feeling like there's, there's only up, like I, how, how much worse can it possibly get? Um, and so rock bottom is going to look different to, to every person, just like experiencing a trauma that, you know, we could put 10 of us in a room together and we all experience Um, someone bursting in with a gun and 10 of us may have 10 different things that we remember about the event, 10 different things that bother us about the event and 10 different ways of, of coping or struggling after the event. And so rock bottom is different for everybody. Um, And, you know, for me, it's just always been um, I've had kind of this, this inner, I don't know, resilience, if you will, I'm not going to let anybody else hold me down. Like this is not this, this may have happened to me, but it's in my control what I do with it from here. And, you know, I'm going to get back up and dust myself off. So um, I would encourage anyone who's, if you feel like you're at rock bottom, then that's your rock bottom. And you may not have had the choice of what happened to you, but you have the choice of how you respond to it. And you have the choice of what comes next for you. I think it's important that we give ourselves grace. You just said it. We're, we're constantly learning and growing and we're becoming, this isn't a destination, right? I don't think you get to a certain point and you're like, ah, I made it. I no longer have to grow. I never have to figure anything Absolutely. else out. It's just this constant process and give yourself some grace along the way. Well, I think you, you made this point um, in your podcast with Phil, Phil Shannon, I think was his name. Oh yeah, and I think mm-hmm. I think the way you said that was better than I tried to explain it in the book was about 
um, we're in this process of becoming, you know, and no one came, no one comes ready made. And, and, you know, the subtitle of the book is 10 keys to become the leader your world is waiting for, because exactly as you say, you know, we are a work in progress. We're always a work in progress. So the power to become is really one of the most powerful um, dynamics we can capture as people because we may not be good at something today, but we may not have a capacity to function in a particular area today. But if we can capture the power to become, then we can grow into that tomorrow. And it might take 30 years. I know for me, <coughs> uh, 30 years ago, I would be a, a cringing mess on the floor in the fetal position at the thought of doing this podcast. Um, <laughs> you know, so I'm not a natural public speaker, um, but that's something that I've grown into. Um, and it's something that I'm continuing to grow into. And um, I love the fact that Phil on that last podcast he talked about the fact that he had a business and you know it was going well and then he had some hard times and he sort of went in a different direction but he came back to it and he rebuilt it and I thought wow that's that's a guy who's captured the dynamic of being able to become because I, I know people that have money or success or certain things but then for whatever reason have lost it and and I can see they don't have the internal capacity to recreate that. Um, so they sort of, um, they don't have those dynamics. So I think that is a really important dynamic that you spoke about. That brings up a really great question. Do you think that leaders, whether leaders of self or leaders of others, are born or created? Without a doubt, leaders are made. Nobody comes ready-made to the role. And everybody, I'm convinced, everybody can become a, a really powerful leader in their world. And, you know, that might be in their home. That might be uh, as, as the prime minister of a nation or the president of a nation. Um, but whatever their world is, everybody can grow and become um, the leader that that world is looking for. So it might be, you know, the coordinator of a community group or something like that. Um, and look, nobody, nobody arrives ready made. I certainly have not. Um, and it's been a real growth journey for me to move into, um, better levels of leadership, I guess you could say. And I'm still so much on that journey, you know, like I'm, I'm barely down the road. So I think with the right input, um, with the right attitude, uh, everybody can learn and, and become that leader. What good does it do to know that creative grief is real and what can we do to prepare ourselves to get through it? Well, first, I think it makes a huge difference and it's of enormous benefit to acknowledge that this is real. Um, because when you don't acknowledge that you're feeling something, you're resisting it. You're not letting your body process it. You're just pushing it away and pushing it away in all sorts of different forms. And so it festers. It doesn't just magically disappear. It doesn't just dissolve. It calcifies and it solidifies inside of you. You know, it's sort of like you're saying, well, you know, if you notice you have a tumor, what good is it to go to the doctor and get that checked out? Shouldn't we just move on with life? You know, no, like you've noticed that this is this is something that's happening to you. This is a disruption. This is an emotional disruption. So if you can acknowledge this is real, this is valid, this is legitimate, I'm okay for feeling this way and I'm allowed to feel this way, you can give yourself the space you need. So you won't be trying to avoid or escape or like jump into writing another book too soon or, you know, distracting yourself and just trying to play a bunch of video games. Like you can really take a few weeks or a few months and say, I'm not really doing anything right now. I'm just kind of allowing myself to be in an open space and let things unfold and let myself process it. And that's okay. Maybe I'm moving a little bit more slowly right now. I'm not going to force it. I'm not going to push myself. I think that's an enormous benefit to a creative person. I love that. Give yourself space and grace. 
which is not what we're taught. You know, we've read books that say as soon as you finish one novel, start the next one the next day. Uh, so it doesn't allow for this kind of uh, space and grace. So for a new uh, author or artist of any kind, any type of creative that maybe has not taken the steps forward right now, Lauren, like they've, it's, I think everybody has a book inside them or something inside them that has to come out. But if they haven't taken that step and now that they know that there might be some grief in publication, whatever that looks like to them, what can they do to help themselves get through that beforehand, maybe? Well, I don't know that there's anything you can do beforehand. There's no way you can predict. It's it's sort of like you're asking me, okay, people who are going to try online dating, how can they, you know, already set themselves up to grieve the loss of any relationships that might come about? <laughs> I mean, that would be nice. And of course, we can all have our arsenal of like self-care tools, you know, our disciplines and our spiritual practices we use. Those will all come in handy. But at the end of the day, you can't predict what kind of relationship you're going to have with anything. You can't predict what kind of relationship you're going to have with different locations on Earth. You know, like some people go to Sedona, Arizona, and they're like, this is the most magical, mystical place I've ever been. And other people are like, yeah, I'm not really feeling it. I don't know what the big deal is. It's going to be like that with everything. You know, you don't know how it's going to turn out for you with each book and each creative work. What I can guarantee is that if you don't put yourself into the situation where you are taking risks in relationships with your creative work, you are going to feel very unhappy in life. If you're just not creating at all because it seems too scary or there might be a grief process at the end or you might have to take an emotional risk. You're going to feel horrible and you're going to feel horrible on a daily basis. And I'm saying that because I've been there. I've had long periods in my life where I wasn't creating and I hated my life. I was not having a happy existence. So that's the one thing that is guaranteed. I think the challenge comes from people who have been on the personal development path or the spiritual development path or any type of development path, right, is um, we almost think there's uh, it's a destination, but it's really it really is a journey, and we don't get to a point where we get it all figured out. And I think a lot of people are expecting that, and they put a lot of pressure on um, technology like the Enneagram or DISC or Myers Briggs or any type of spiritual dogma or any of that. And it's it's not the end all be all. It's just another tool to learn to get to know yourself better and better and better. The um, other thing, before we talk about the the numbers, I'd like to hear your perspective on this, Linda, is a lot of people are turned off by personality systems because they think these classification systems put us into a box. Can you um, maybe address that concern first before we start talking about the different numbers? Sure. I'd like to talk about both of those things. One of the things that the Enneagram does is uh, help you relate to yourself compassionately. And and when you find that you lead with a certain type, you have good reasons to lead with that type. And there's strengths and weaknesses, as I said to all. So uh, it it really is, it actually um, relieves a lot of pressure. And so that shame that you've been feeling all your life, you spoke to it briefly, uh, Bill, when you said you realized you were different than the people in your family. And um, and, you know, when you find there are other people who think the same way you do and address life the same way and, and react in the same way, there's such a relief. So there's a pressure to figure it all out. But there's also the compassion for yourself when you find out, OK, I am not terminally unique. I am my own person. I'm not a clone. But I, I am one of many, you know. Yeah. And then there's there's aspects of myself that I can grow. And there's a roadmap, as I said. This is a roadmap to say, well, now I can develop this and that and the other. And um, and it's really, really a beautiful thing. So I'd say that that's the first thing. The second thing is that when people say I don't like any of these systems because they put me in a box, whether it's a, you know, ENTJ or whether it's a, a DI or it's a um, an Enneagram number, they don't want to go there because they think that's limiting. What I often say, especially about the Enneagram, is you're already in a box. You know, you're in the box of these five things that I've mentioned. 
and you don't know it. <laughs> You're in your genetic predisposition and that family of origin and the, and what you believed about yourself and the, uh, all the experiences you've acquired. And you're, you're in that box already. What the Enneagram does is help you identify that so you can open doors and windows and you have access and you can knock down some of those, uh, those walls. The ultimate reason to even do the Enneagram to find yourself is because if you continue to work it, you'll be able to embrace the highest and the best of all these types. And, but that's a lifetime work. This is a body and it doesn't mean like, you have to go to a class every week or something. It doesn't mean you're in school all the time. It just means that it's a development and an unfolding. And there have been many people who have, have developed highly in their lives. And, uh, the most important thing is feeling less shame, feeling good about yourself, really being able to relate well with others, to be the best version of yourself that you came here to be. Now, there's one question that I always ask uh, when we get into these opportunities. We've talked a lot about how we can stand out and thrive and uh, succeed at this. But my question is, in your years of experience in helping others, who fails at this business? Yeah, I, I, it's a great question. And, and there's a lot to that. But on my podcast every week, I say uh, this catchphrase <laughs> because and, and I actually heard it from somebody. So it's not something I made up. But I say, if you don't quit, you win. And I, I think the people who fail are the people who just stop moving forward. They stop going for it, right? Um, there's a, um, a, a friend of mine named Daryl Vesterfelt who runs an agency um, that says your your business fails the moment you stop working on it, the moment you say that you're done, you know? And so you have to have um, a certain amount of grit, no matter what you do, but for sure with side hustles and for sure with web design and and web development. And if there's if there's any secret sauce to my success, it would be the fact that I, under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, a lot of really tough life moments, I just found a way to keep going. And sometimes there's the seasons of keeping going was super unproductive, right? I didn't get much done at all. Um, but slow growth is way better than no growth, right? Like I'd rather take one to two steps a year than take 20 steps in a year and zero steps the next, you know, like looking at it as a marathon and saying like, I don't, I think the world gives us a lot of pressure when we look at businesses. And if we don't hit those like skyrocket marks of like, I made a million dollars as a one person business doing a side hustle. And I had, you know, a full-time job and 20 kids and, you know, all these other things that I had to do. I only, I'd never hired a mechanic to work on my vehicles and yet I still was successful. It's like, those are the stories that we highlight and, um, you know, are familiar with, but really it, most people, <laughs> it's that slow grind year over year, just taking steps, small, small little decisions to say yes, small decisions to say, I'm, I'm not going to quit, I'm, even though I really want to. Those are the things that are really beautiful to me. And that's, that's been how I've been able to stay in this, you know, and um, when I was first looking into web design, I did a lot of Googling and trying to see what other people were doing. Um, and I would pull up sites that were gone, you know, like they were 404 errors. Like this site is no longer here. And I'm like, man, is this, what is up with web designers? Like they, they just, they try it for a year and don't keep going. But maybe that, I, maybe that's true for everybody in that it's, it's just really easy to get discouraged and, and to just give up altogether. But if you stick at it, you are, de are, are eventually going to find, the, the route to success. It sounds like some self-love and forgiveness plays into this. What do you think of that? Absolutely. Um, you know, think about what I said earlier, giving yourself permission, I think is one of the greatest acts of self-love. Giving yourself permission to say this thing that I've, d I've chosen doesn't fit me anymore. Um, you know, giving yourself permission to say, whatever this that I have is, it's not that it's not good enough. It's not that I'm not satisfied with it. It has served me well, but I've outgrown it. And so it's time for me to appreciate what it was and now build what's next. And, and, you know, I think that's something that we just don't do. 
for ourselves. And, you know, you said living up to other people's expectations or worrying what other people think. It's interesting. The people who I can think of two examples of this, but the people who I talk to and I've been slowly easing into this process. Um, you know, I think I said it earlier, it was a huge step for me to switch my about on my Facebook to just say principal to principal, podcast host, author, keynote speaker. And then I hit the button and then was like, oh my God, what are people going to say? They're going to wonder what I'm doing. They're going to think I'm going through a midlife crisis. And all I got as a response was awesome. Cool. That's great. Can't wait to see what it's all about, you know? So it's, it's having that courage to put stuff out there. And then you're, you're so worried about what people are going to think. And then you end up being shocked to find that 90% of the people are going to be like, good for you. And the 10% that aren't, um, often it's not judgment, it's jealousy. And here's what I mean by that. Um, when I was getting divorced low these many years ago, um, you know, people had their opinions and the people that I found when I look back now, who were the most judgmental about uh, the choices that we were making as a family um, were unhappily married women. They were the most vocal to me or behind my back about the choices that I was making. And now, you know, 15, 16, 17, whatever it's been years later, um, it's interesting to me how many of them are divorced. <laughs> um, you know, so similarly, I would say when I talk now ever about, you know, I might not be the principal of this building anymore. I might switch to another job in education. I might just become a consultant. I might, I'm not sure, but I feel like maybe I've, you know, outgrown my time here and it's time to move on to something else. And there are people who are like, that's awesome. But then there's people that are like, I don't want a new principal. You know, I, I don't, I don't want you to leave. You shouldn't leave. You, you won't be happy because I don't want a new principal. Well, is that about me or is that about you? <laughs> and so, right. you know, I think a lot of times when people say to you, you shouldn't, what they're really saying is I couldn't. I'm not sure everyone has a an understanding of what it means to be authentic. So I wondered if you could, let's just start out with that. Tell me what does often being authentic mean to you? Uh, being authentic means that you're being your true self 24 seven. So not just one, I always like to say, it's too hard to be two people, Bill. I can barely be Mary Fane Brandt, right? Just me. I can't slice me up and be one person online and a different person in real life. That's not being authentic. So if people see you online, right? They see your content. They maybe see a video. They listen to your podcast. And then they were to meet you in person. There would be a disconnect if you were not the same person in, you know, on air versus in person. And I think that is what it means to be authentic. Be yourself, you guys. And you've met me online and then in person, right? I'm yeah. bold. I wear bright colors. I talk with my hands. I'm very enthusiastic and passionate about certain subjects. I'm that way online. And I love that you said I, there's a little Mary isms in there in, in my content and how I present myself. Because back in the day, Bill, when I first started my first business, true career coaching, I tried to put myself in a box. I tried to be this professional that I thought I needed to be online. And, you know, I come from corporate, right? So you're in a box. You don't talk about your personal life. You're one person at work. You're a different person at home. Well, and I did webinars and stuff. And every time I tried to put myself in this box of where I thought I needed to be, how I thought my audience wanted me to be, I didn't come across as my authentic self. And you know what happened? I couldn't connect to my audience. They didn't connect with me. They were like, oh, she sounds like everyone else. Like I actually did a yeah. webinar and we had very low um, uh, signups, not for the original webinar, but for the program. 
because I didn't put my face on camera. I was afraid how I was going to look. I was afraid that, oh my gosh, I have notes. I have to read them word for word for the script I've worked on. And it didn't come through as being authentic. My voice didn't come through. I was scripted. I was like a robot. And don't forget to do this when you're on LinkedIn at 8 a.m. You know, so that doesn't work. When I throw the scripts out the door and when I just go live on the camera, my authentic self comes through, mistakes and all. And that's okay because that makes me more human, which yeah. makes me more relatable. And I think people are craving that. In fact, as you were speaking, it became clear. It's like everything that, uh, he, let's say, uh, people in the workforce in America or the business force or whatever it is, everything that so many people despise, um, the, those canned responses, sales, everything about those uh, experiences or those interactions are usually tied to in authenticity. It's people not showing up to the human experience, being salesy, um, almost slimy because you're forgetting that there's a human being on the other side. You're not even showing up as your human self. So I think that's really uh, the power of authenticity that, that you're talking about here. So when, when you finally did that, what happened for you? When you boom, <laughs> <laughs> I was more relatable. People were engaging with my posts. They were signing up to be my client because I was sharing my real stories. I wasn't trying to come off as, hey, life is perfect. My business is wonderful. I've never had any problems. That's bullshit. Okay. And it, at, at, at my point in my career and my life, if I haven't gone through some shit, then I haven't lived. Right. And yeah. it's going through that shit, those troubles, those experiences that give us the knowledge and the solutions to help our clients. I was a job seeker at 50 years old. I lost the job that I thought I was going to have forever. And that's a different story. So I was like, oh, my God, who's going to hire me? What am I going to do? And I started my own business helping other women. I became a career coach, helping other um, midlife women, you know, 40 and above, um, how they pivot, how they rebrand themselves. Um, mm. And so I really feel being yourself and sharing your struggles and sharing your stories, that helps you relate to, to your audience. And as you said, now more than ever, after 2020, people are, they're like, screw that corporate stuff, throw it out the window. I want to know who Bill is day in and day out. What do you do? Do you have dogs? Do you have cats? I mean, I know because we've met in person and we chatted and right. you're amazing and fun and intelligent and just you're real. You are who you are online as you are offline. <laughs>